Hey guys, I hit a bit of an impasse working on this GE800. My electrolytic capacitor supplies are running low and I just don't have what I need. So while I'm waiting for an order to arrive, I thought I would do a quick little project. So, got to looking around the workshop and I could spend some time cleaning up and organizing, but that's no fun. So how about we get something working? Well, what caught my interest was that gold paneled piece of equipment back there hiding behind some TV test equipment is a Philco 077 it's an early signal generator I believe from the early 30s there's a very cool Art Deco look to it I did a video when I first got it but I have not done any work on restoring it so let's pop it open and see what we can do here's a closer look at it a rather cool front panel. I don't know if it's solid brass or brass plated. It's some nice black lacquer and uh, raised lettering. Looks like the whole thing is clear coated maybe. And a really sweet frequency control using well basically a filco radio knob. A nice vernier action. The grease must not be too dried up on this because it actually works all right. Uh, so we got band switch. We can go from audio, which is the A band. It goes 120 to 350. That's maybe hertz. A band 350 to 1000. Good for radio IFs. 455. Uh, switch. I think is off a little bit. So audio A B C. Goes from 1050 to 3.5 megahertz. And we got 3.5 megahertz to 11 megahertz, and finally 11 megahertz to 35. Be curious to see how well this does towards the upper range. Knowing how early this is, uh, high frequencies uh, generally didn't work too well. What the types of tubes they had? Uh, this can do AM modulation. Uh, this is also a power switch. It looks like. So this is off, this is on with modulation, and modulation off. I think that's the way that works. Now this is something I wanted to talk about a little bit. The attenuator and the multiplier. So this is what controls the output level. It may seem like something pretty trivial, pretty boring, but it's actually one of the things that separates uh, lab grade or um, higher end service grade equipment from hobbyist equipment. So yeah, you can go on eBay, you can get an RF generator for 10 bucks, uh, even when it's digitally uh, synthesized. But they will either have just a f uh, fixed level high impedance output, or maybe they throw a potentiometer between the output and ground and take the output at the tap you will have a miserable time trying to align with that. Why? Because it's a very, very coarse, crude method, method of uh, changing the output level. So just put a pot on there. One, it has high input impedance, sort of. It actually, actually, the output impedance varies as you slide the wiper from one end to the other because the signal goes into the high end of the wiper. It'll go down through some resistance and then out, or sorry, one end of the pot go through some resistance and then out the tap. So why does that matter? When you're working on radios, especially aligning them, uh, they have a lot of gain. They generally are picking up very, very weak signals out of the air and amplifying them quite a bit. So if your off generator is putting out something like 10 volts peak to peak, 1 volt peak to peak, it's way, 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 way too much. When you're like all the way like feeding a signal into the antenna, you're talking microvolts, millions of volts. And as you go through each stage of amplification, you want to decrease your signal level because it's being amplified through the tubes. So, something like this, they give you range. So this is the highest level, then I divide it by 10, by 100, by 1000, and then this is your potentiometer. And uh, on better equipment, this will also be a constant output impedance, typically like 50 ohms. 
Why does that matter? Because you don't want your output level to vary uh, depending on the load. You want constant in input, constant uh, impedance. Now, when you're feeding it like into the antenna input or into an IF stage on an old tube radio, the output impedance isn't that much. But it's nice to have something that's got um, a little bit of oomph. So whatever you attach to doesn't drag the signal down. Now this is a pretty early device, so I believe there is no output amplifier on it. I think we've got three tubes in here. A rectifier, an audio oscillator tube, and an RF oscillator tube, and that's it. Two triodes and a rectifier, and that's it. Better equipment would have a low impedance amplifier, like a cathode follower on it. But not for something this early and this basic. And uh, I'm curious to see how accurate this is. These can be surprisingly accurate. Because most of the engineering on these is going to go into this. The variable capacitors and inductors and band switch. And the lead dressing and all that stuff. Because there's, <laughs> uh, there's no crystal reference in here or anything like that. So the mechanical stuff matters. The engineering precision matters. Well, that was fun. Lots and lots and lots of screws. I think I got them all out. Yeah. Curious construction. It's actually uh, two front panels. There's a steel one that really holds things together, and then there's a decorative one. And they're held together by the two inner screws there that I did not have to remove. Otherwise, the whole thing is attached to the front plate, so when you take that off, there's the whole device. Not much left behind here, except for that. So that is definitely one of the first things we got to take care of. As for the rest of it, here's a look. It looks like somebody, I can't remember when I opened this up before, did I start working on it or did somebody else? But this has Bakelite blocks and early type resistors just like radio filco radios of the era. There's the three tubes I talked about. And it's all filco parts. So this very straightforward layout. This is the power supply. So the power transformer, early type of rectifier 6x5. Yes I know the issues these can have with shorting out. I believe these are all the original tubes. Uh, they're all labeled Filco. Oh, well, well, that's an RCA. Spoke too soon. Uh, anyways, so, power transformer, rectifier, filter cap. And some type of dividers down here. And we'll have to see what's in that big light block down there. It'll have some capacitors in it. Uh, and then this side will have, this will be the RF oscillator. And the uh, audio oscillator. Variable capacitor, and there is that output attenuator. And down here are your band switches, which switch in different inductors, and there's trimmer caps to fine tune it. And I can see there are a couple paper caps down in there that are going to be a little tricky to get at. Oh man, I don't really know how I'm going to get down in there. Otherwise, there's not much to replace. So, two paper caps there. Rebuild that bake light block and rebuild the bake light block on the input. So, I'm going to put this aside and let's talk about the AC light input for a moment. So, this is missing its line cord. Here's where it attached, sort of like a TV interlock. I'm lucky I might have something that would fit on that. And the other side goes into a line filter. So inside this are two capacitors going on either side of the AC line to ground. 
So here's your AC in. And inside here are two caps, one going from here to here, one going from the middle to here. And then this is going to the chassis. And we've got two coils. And that big light block on the other chassis is another one of these. So two caps, two coils, two caps, two coils, two caps. And then it goes into the power transformer. That is there to filter out noise. It's an early life filter. And these are 0.15 microfarad caps in here. That's a pretty darn large value for a line cap. You should use a Y type capacitor. Those are rated for working across the AC line to ground. Something like this. These are 0.1s. 0.15 is a pretty large value. So it's probably going to be a bit of a spark when I plug this in. In case you ever wondered why when you plug certain things in you see a spark, this can be a reason why. It's because they actually have capacitors inside of them and when you're plugging it in it's charging them up. But this is an X2 type. This is going right from the hot to the neutral, not from the hot to ground or neutral to ground. So I don't need a Y type. So I think these are... Yeah, these are Y types, although these are .01, so they're too small. I, record, I recall finding something and ordering it up a while ago when I got this, and I was I thought I'd be restoring it a lot sooner, so i got to dig around my parts and see what I can dig up with. Now, you can leave this off entirely and bypass it, and the thing will work. But it does help to keep noise out and noise from this getting back into the line, so uh, I will endeavor to make it work. So other than that, yeah, there's, other than the line conditioning filter, there's just two paper caps and um, uh, several electrolytics. Although, let's take another look. This might just be a single section. No. That electrolytic has three wires coming out of it, so I'm going to guess it has three sections. And then the can would be ground. Oh, and if you're wondering what that big lumpy thing there is, I believe that is the, uh, sorry, that guy, that is the audio oscillator transformer. Aha, I knew I had ordered some up. 0.15 microfarad type Y2. Question is, well, two of these fit into one of these. I think they just might. Alright, so Philco Bakelite blocks. Very briefly, there are numerous techniques for dealing with these. All of them um, work. Uh, some pros, some cons. Everybody has their own preferred technique, it seems like. Generally, what I do is First from the top side, well first I should explain what these are. So this is a Bakelite little like bathtub thing filled with, it seems like tar, but I guess it's actually a high temperature type of wax, uh, petroleum based something or another, that melts when it gets hot enough. So one way to do it is get out a heat gun and heat that up until all this starts flowing out. And I've got it warm enough, it'll just all come out, but you'll have a big mess on your hands. So a more controlled approach is usually appropriate. Um, and if you just soften it up, well, let me let me take a step back. So there's capacitors inside of here that are not encapsulated, paper caps. And the idea was that the wax would uh, protect them from the environment, and then you put them in this nice big light housing, which has lugs on it, and you can wire up your other components to that, use them as... So it's a combination, terminal strip, and component, multi, multi-component thing. <laughs> so like a really, really, really primitive uh, integrated circuit. Occasionally there's a wire-wound resistor in them, but generally it's capacitors. And pretty, pretty typically two of them. And uh, typically, the common will be this lug, so there are actually two little wires going around this one, and one wire there, one wire there. Uh, and this end is all sealed up, so the, the parts go in and out on this side. 
Now, if you were to start heating that up and digging in there and trying to get them out, the problem is the leads are attached on this side. So what you really want to do is break those leads. So if you take a sharp uh, knife, like a utility knife, uh, and get in there, you can just cut right through those fine leads. And then what I like to do is heat up the other side a little bit, just to soften it kind of around the edges. And then take a small screwdriver and kind of dig in there and pry them up, but not so hard you bust out the side. Um, some guys uh, do this without heating it up at all. Uh, like you can drive a corkscrew in there and kind of pull it out. I've even heard if you put them in the freezer, it makes this stuff so brittle. It really breaks apart easily. That I have not tried. Uh, also in terms of, well, how do you do it while it's in circuit? Again, numerous techniques. Some guys are able to do what I did here, which is to take out the mounting lug, carefully twist it around, and don't disconnect any wires, and do all your work with it kind of in place. I find in some radios, and there's a lot of wires going there, that's just uh, too difficult to do. So you can undo all the wires and take it out, rebuild it, put it back in, rehook up the wires. The only downside to that is with this early type of wiring. It's got like gutta percha stuff on it. Yeah, I said gutta percha. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Uh, it's a type of rubber, natural rubber. And believe it or not, they actually use that in root canals, I believe, to this day, to pack your tooth in. It's a natural substance. It doesn't seem to interact with the body. <laughs> At least that's what I've read. I have not luckily had to have a root canal but just a little bit of history for you there. So why do I go on about it? Well, one, over time, it, uh, like most rubbers, natural rubbers, gets hard. That's why when you bend these wires, sometimes you hear them like breaking and cracking. Cloth covering on the outside, which is certainly flexible, but around that, there's a core of hardened rubber insulation. However, just like this tar and this block, when you heat it up, it softens. However, when you heat it up a lot, like when you're soldering a joint, it kind of melts and will flow into the cloth. So what often happens, if you look at a radio that's been reworked, they do a beautiful job in the Bakelite blocks, but the ends of all the wires for a quarter inch or so are all blackened because uh, that, they've got a percha and maybe even some of the melted wax tar inside of here is soaked into the cloth and discolored it. Not the greatest looking thing. So, if you can avoid heating up these wires, all the better. Um, but, you know, it depends how obsessive you want to be about this. Who the heck is going to look inside these things and critique the way the wires look? But I'm just throwing that out there. If you want to go through the trouble of rebuilding these and making everything look pristine when you heat up these wires, the ends can discolor. Okay, so what am I going to do right here, right now? Uh, uh, well, I'm going to get a knife, and I'm going to cut those little fine wires, and then I'll uh, see about this side. I'll try to get the camera so you guys have a decent angle. I uh, couldn't find a knife, but i uh, got a razor blade here. It works well enough, so I'm going to cut these leads. I got a comment on a video, well, more of a question. A couple weeks ago, it's been kind of rattling around in my head, which is, um, when I'm making these videos, who am I talking to? <laughs> well, uh, it's a good question. Um, hadn't really thought about it before. Usually I'm by myself. Maybe there's a dog here. Or rarely, occasionally, there's another human being. Sometimes I'm just kind of talking to myself to work through a problem, talking out loud. Generally, I'm talking to you, the audience, as if you were here going through the process with me. Uh, <laughs> nobody's ever asked me that before. Yeah, basically, uh, I'm talking to you guys, uh, hoping you get some enjoyment out of going through the process with me. I've seen some videos where um, it's a completely a voice a voiceover. I don't know if they didn't record audio while they were filming it or it didn't turn out, but it's just kind of boring, I think. Or there'll be cheesy background music and maybe it's just uh, subtitles. But, you know, to be fair, maybe they're 
English isn't their native language and they're uh, it just got translated. I don't know, um, but yeah, I do try to tend, I do sometimes ramble on a bit. Uh, I'll try to stay focused on this project here. I do want to keep this to a quick, short project. So um, this is one way you can go at it: just cold and just start digging your way in. This stuff digs away pretty easy. I generally just use a small screwdriver. Uh, this is a rather large one, um, and this would take quite a while, and there's a good chance I would break through that block if I keep going at it like this. So I am going to use a little bit of heat. I will warn you, this stuff can emit some fumes. It's, like I said, it's, according to their literature, it's high temperature wax. It smells like tar to me. Oops. Uh, I should mention there is one other way to do it, to heat it up, which is with your soldering iron. You heat up those lugs on the other side, the heat gets transferred to the interior and right into the caps, which can also soften it up. Now I have no intention of like just fully melting this out, I just want to soften it up a little bit. And I do want to keep the odor to a minimum. So this is just a Wagner uh, two setting heat gun meant for uh, softening up paint, for stripping paint off a house. Oh, already starting to smell. All right, so yeah, it doesn't take much. Let's see what that got us. The topmost layer should be much softer now. Oh, yeah. You see one of the caps already emerging. And so this is messy. Um, you might want to put something down below it to catch all this stuff as it falls out of this kind of sticky, kind of nasty stuff. It does tend to get everywhere. And there's two of them exposed. So I'm going to focus a bit more so I can see that there's a bit of a gap down here. And if I can soften that up. And get one of the screwdriver in there and then try to pop them out. Some people hate these. Personally, I kind of like them. It's it's novel. It kind of breaks up the monotony of terminal strips. Uh, I don't think they're all that bad to work with. And uh, if you want to retain originality, I mean, when you're done, you don't see any of the new caps that are all hidden away. Also, you don't have to deal with making any pigtails to splice in the new caps. Deal with component leads being too short when you use modern caps with short leads that work out great in these. Oh, 
so this is in the pretty beefy caps. Thirty four and thirty nine right now, and I'm no idea what that means. I'll clean out what's left inside here. See if any caps will fit. Okay, I got most of the crap. Okay, I got most of it chipped away. If you, again, if you really want to be obsessive with this, paint thinner works quite well to clean out any remaining wax. So, two new caps. Oh, look at that. Perfect. Once I bend the leads over, that should fit in there perfectly. But I really got lucky on that. When we're all the way down, the leads through, they will be completely flush. If I really, really, really wanted to complete the look, I could take black hot glue, which I've done in the past, and melt it over that. I don't think I have any hot glue sticks handy. But uh, I'm sure you've all seen hot glue guns with white sticks. You can get them in different colors, brown and black, for example. So the black works out really well on this application. Now I'll have to do a little bit of work here to get the leads to line up right. The, these are meant for circuit board mounting, so very short leads. So two of them I need to get tied together and go out one of these, and then the other two to the other holes. So I'll have to uh, get some small wire and wire some extensions on there and feed them in. I don't think that will be too difficult. Now, more typically when you get modern film caps, they're going to be more like this which have long leads. These have especially nice long leads on them. And you use these, you have no problem. These go right through those holes, go through the other side, or wrap around the lug side, or in. you are done. These are Panasonic. For anybody who's curious, Panasonic film caps are quite nice in that they have decent lead lengths on them. Here's some other modern film caps. These might also be Panasonic, and again, pretty nice lead length on them. But unfortunately, these .15s for AC rated, Y rated applications are not very common at all. This is the best I could find. I would feel quite lucky that they actually fit inside there. So if I clean up all this crud and wire them up, remount that and then move on to the main chassis. I finally located the service info so let's see if we can get a little... I print out a fresh copy of the I printed out a fresh copy of the documentation for this signal generator First page covers various modes and operation. Make it into a little bit of calibration. There's a trimmer for each scale. But for now, let's focus on schematic. So this is the area I've been working on. There's your AC coming in. There's those two capacitors and that big light block I'm working on right now. There's two inductors. And then there's two more of the same caps. That's on a big light block on the main chassis. Then the power transformer. So all this is to filter noise on the AC line. After that, conventional full wave rectifier with a 6X5G, 16 microfarad electrolytic. We're going to be replacing that guy. 
then we've got a dropper resistor here so we got about 5,000 ohms and then going to 9,000 ohms so this is going to divide the voltage down to put another filter cap there 16 microfarad I think that says and so there were a couple paper caps so I'm you can kind of tell them on a schematic like this so right nothing is labeled on here right except if you notice some of these like this is 0.3 UF or micro F microfarad 0 0.03 microfarad likewise 0 0.05 microfarad and this guy you see it's 250 micro microfarad typically on schematics if it's a paper cap it's going to be in microfarad range 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0.03, and so on. Maybe up until about one microfarad. For the picofarad range caps, or micro microfarad, you won't have that decimal point. It'll be a whole number. So t typically, these caps are our mica, and they'd be in the range of like 10 micro microfarad to maybe well under a thousand. About a thousand is where they kind of cross over from mica into paper, at least on more modern stuff. So as a test equipment, or uh, I mean, I've seen them up as as much as 4,700 probably, but uh, typically about a thousand micro microfarads is a crossover point from one type of cap to another. Now I see there's one down here. It's 3,000 microfarad micro microfarad so there's an exception to that that is probably a mica cap but these two guys 0 0.05 microfarad also two paper caps I'm sure also notice this says 16 there's an arrow to both that's probably a bakelite block that's typically how they indicate those likewise over here one designator pointing to two caps there's two caps and with one part number. That's what these numbers are on the circle, the part numbers. That's probably a Bakelite block. Now, it just so happens there is actually a parts list that comes with this. So. <laughs> I was just illustrating in case you didn't have this. So let's go down this list here. Here's all the parts. So in fact, they spell out right there, 0 0.05 microfarad tubular. That means paper capacitor. 3,000 micro microfarad, and they say right there, mica. And they designate the wattage for the resistor, so really, we're lucky in this case that everything is very clearly spelled out. And there's the big light block, no bones about it. There's the two there on the AC line, and then there's another big light block here. Very, very readable, comprehensive parts list. This is uh, not typical. When you find vintage radio service info. Here's the capacitors ready for mounting. So two of the ends got tied together with a bus line. This will go to the grounding lug on that. And each of the other two go to the other two. So these will go to either side of the AC line. I think I've got them spaced pretty well. Let's see. Not a tight fit. I was just looking online a little while ago at the antique radio forum. Or no, maybe it was on Facebook, I don't know. But uh point is um, somebody <laughs> had worked on one of these Philco's, it was a radio, and uh, the big light blocks, and they really butchered it. Instead of doing this, what they did is they cut the terminals apart at the top, so that they completely isolated the components inside, and then took the remnants and just kind of tacked in some parts floating, not very well secured, really ugly way to do things. Easy fit. I think I got it. One, two, three leads coming out. All right. It's just fit in. I mean, 
boy. <laughs> Not a millimeter to spare widthwise. It's really remarkable that uh, modern parts just happen to fit like that. All right, so now on this side, we just wrap these wires around the lugs here, and uh, we're done. Well, aside from remounting it. So, all in all, not a big deal. Let me solder those up, and we are done. Took all of about 10 minutes. So, if you're wondering why I'm struggling a little, I'll back up the camera. Expand my field of view a little bit. So, soldering iron station I'm using right now is one I have been using since the dawn of my YouTube channel. And I got it a short time before that even. In other words, it's more than 10 years old. Weller WES51, it has served me well. I have used this on every single restoration project I have ever done. Only issue I have with it is what's going on right now. This connector is a little flaky. So right now there's no power going to the iron. I was trying to solder that and it had cooled off. And now we go, restore continuity. I do have a new one. I bought it. Oh, went out again. I bought it. Uh, on Black Monday or whatever, <laughs> you know, after or Cyber Monday, whatever they call it, after Black Friday, after Thanksgiving, they had these on sale on Amazon, so I picked one up. Or not this exact model, but the new equivalent of it. Be talking more about that in a future video. All right now, I think I'm back in business. Everybody's got their favorite iron, their favorite brand. I just know what I know. This is what I've used for a very long time, and it's served me well for a very long time. Starting to get a little flaky now, and I'm sure I could fix that connector. But I heard good things about the newer version, so uh, I picked one up. At any rate, that is that. Just got to find the hardware, so I'm remount it, and. Uh, All right, now for the main chassis. Might as well keep on the roll and do Bakelite blocks. So I noted this one earlier. I believe this is the other AC block. I had disconnected some of the leads because this actually is hardwired to the one that's inside the cabinet. So to get the, the front off from the main body of the cabinet, you have to disconnect those two wires. So I'll do exactly the same thing on this and put in the other two of those big blue caps and I didn't notice this earlier but there's the other big light block down in there that's <laughs> well it's all going to be tricky to get at so we got that big light block there and then two paper caps hiding beneath the trimmer so that, that is the band switch so that is switching out these various coils for the various bands and these are the trimmer caps to calibrate it Ah, so one possibility is to take off this knob to loosen up the switch and lift it up a little out of, out of, out of position. Depending on how long the wires are, I might be able to move it aside a little bit and help me get at things. I think these knobs might just, oh yes, <laughs> just pull off. These are really cool knobs too. They use these for the band switch on a few radios from around, I think, 1936. Otherwise, they used them on some other test equipment. Real nice, big light switches. Some of the reasons I bought this particular one is that it had all the knobs 
and the front panel is in really good shape. So we get that off, and then there's just a big old nut, and I think uh, that is it. And that should loosen up. Probably not the worst thing in the world, because while I got it loosened up, I can uh, clean it out too, clean the switch contacts. But, save that for a little bit later right now, I will do the one that I can get at. And I will check these two resistors. These must be those bleeder resistors for the voltage divider we're looking at on the schematic. And there's the big old filter cap. Hope all these tubes are good. Because they are all the original early type. In other words, is the 6X5G. The later 6X5s were a little short, uh, octal looking tubes. I like to look at this one better. It's, it's uh, fitting for the vintage look. Likewise, I kind of hope these resistors are within spec and I can just leave them alone.